And we're live with another episode of Enter the Matrix. For a moment, Nathan is not with us because his PC decided to crash as soon as Vic joined, which is very convenient at this point. But as I mentioned right now, we've got Vic on this week's episode, where we'll try to talk about LGT and how we think it translates in overall to Teams Meta. Obviously, we have a good grasp of the state of the meta now with all the data coming in and the statistics that we can actually get an idea how the meta will develop moving forward. But how are you doing, Vic? How was your experience with LGT? Oh, thanks for having me on, Typhus. Uh, LGT was great. I really enjoy the event. I've been going for quite a few years now. I have historically been very bad at the LGT, but these last two years uh, have been really good for me. So managed to, to make a good run this time, same as last year, and uh, had, a, had a really good time. I mean, to some extent, you only surfaced around two years ago, as far as I remember. So I don't think this is much of a surprise. Like, But this year, you could even call yourself, to some extent, extinguisher with how <laughs> many Ignite players you needed to take down to actually get into the position you were in. But then you got extinguished yourself. I did. Uh, so no bad blood within your team after all of that? No, none at all. It's a, it's a bit unfortunate when, you know, you play seven rounds and hit your teammates. When we only have a team of eight people, uh, you hit your teammates with three rounds. And uh, unfortunately, the two of the teammates I hit had an identical list to me. So it was it was really like um, a bit unfortunate. The mathematics I, aren't... I mean, uh, Yoku had one unit different. Mm -hmm, he did. <laughs> Brian had exactly the same and we deployed the same, same secondaries, absolutely everything the same. Uh, and then Liam showed me how it was done. He showed everyone, exactly. apparently, that he is just the prodigy of 40k. Maybe Atlanta will be his another scalp. I, I hope so. Fingers crossed, to be honest. He is an awesome chap to actually get that done, and he was on the radar. He, he's also quite new to the competitive scene, right? I remember he surfaced during the COVID era with all the TTS games or all the TTS events, he was in the hottest X team, I think, at that point, mm -hmm. if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. And then he got into the team and it was like he got quite good to lately. But uh, before we get into the things that everyone love, which is tier list and having very confronting opinions where everyone will happily disagree with us. We have luckily Nathan hey. uh, with a camera now. Maybe Nathan, you have your mic on. Or no. <laughs> uh, uh, at some point, we'll try to get him. But yeah, uh, in the given the state of the meta, what was your feeling before and after LGT? How do you feel about? the state of the game now because I think people felt like Eldari weren't hit well enough and that the meta would still be very dominated by Eldar. But do you feel that this was actually the case in, in this situation as well? I mean, the results would probably suggest that Eldar are probably still a little bit too strong, especially at the top levels of, of competitive play. But what I found quite interesting is whenever there's a balance update just prior to a UK super major, where there isn't an established meta, people are coming up with creative ideas. I find that UKTC events always show off some kind of interesting directions that the meta may take. Um, and a big part for our team is trying to work out what the strengths are in the meta immediately after a balanced data slate. And we kind of landed on CSM and Eldar. And I think um, you know it did prove to be probably the two strongest kind of factions coming through LGT. Hey, Nathan. Yeah, Hell. you managed to get everything done. Yeah, and yeah, I don't, don't think the factions that are on the top are kind of surprising to us. I think it made sense, although I was like slightly surprised that CSM got so much better. But after some more in depth thinking about it, it made sense because they have the best MSU build in the game with how much they can trade up with their even two models, if need be. But Eldar, to be fair, I expect it to be a little bit stronger than they turned out. Like, 
I felt, I think this was a common feeling. And this is another thing that I wanted to ask you because before LGT, you spent what, two months playing only WTC boards. How much do you think that the UKTC boards actually impacted the army choices and how you perceive the meta? Because you can tell, like, for example, the UKTC boards have very good staging, right? So if you're playing melee army with good range, threat range of that melee, like Chosen, you suddenly have very good positioning on the board. So what's your take on it? Uh, to be honest, I think with the the changes to terrain rules and the latest UKTC setups, which are actually the, the firing lanes are massively restricted on the UKTC setup now. Uh, and I'd argue even more than WTC, but not by much. In my opinion, I think list design is not going to vary too significantly. Maybe list design within factions is going to vary a little bit, but I don't think UKTC and WTC are going to vastly shift the meta base just on terrain. Personally, I'm not sure. Yeah, and I think that this makes sense because when you look at it historically, UKTC didn't have any dense terrains. I mean, it had those wheeled elves, but no difficult grounds in ninth edition. Mm -hmm. And now I think both GW boards, the WTC boards and UKTC boards tend to be playing on the same kind of terrain style mm -hmm. where the main difference is how high the pieces are. Mm -hmm. So how well you can hide, but other than that, all of them have enclosed bottom floor windows and actually you can hide. So that one seems uh, quite obvious that they do not make a, that much of a difference. But Nathan, as we've got you back, What's going on with you? Because we just had a quick chat with Vic while you were out struggling with the PC master race. Yes, with the wooden PC uh, and my technological lack of know-how. <laughs> um, but no, I thought one thing was interesting for LGT because I think when the balance update all came out, we all kind of looked at, say, like Liam Hackett's style Necron list being, oh, actually, this could potentially be bordering on dominant because you only have to win games by small margins surprisingly didn't do phenomenally well at LGT. I think only one Necron army went 5-0, and which was Mark Crumble home. And they just, I guess CSM can block it off a bit and Eldar can, again, kind of block it off as well. But then neither of those really kill the blobs too easily. The 10 Chosen, I guess, can. Uh, I just thought, I thought it was more interesting that they weren't going to be there. I, I think it made like sense that. overall because, and when we get to the tier, tier list of the armies, it will make more sense, at least when I will try to give my points. I think there's too many counters to the Necrons in the meta to reliably take them to singles because you need to dodge and weave way more armies that you would need to dodge with, say, CSM or Eldar. Like, there are armies that you feel like you have no game into. Whereas when you're playing CSM or Eldar, it doesn't feel like it. Obviously, they are top armies, so it also boosts it. But what's your take on the Necrons, state of the Necrons? We know that David was planning to take them, Vic. Mm -hmm. what? Uh, and I he think... trained you how to kill them. <laughs> he, he gave us some ideas, whether or not they're consistent for Eldar, which uh, I think struggle a little bit against horde type armies like this. Um, it was tough to really analyze because it didn't really come up at LGT. I think there were quite a few different factors involved in this discussion. One is, I think in LGT, a lot of the good players probably dropped off Necrons because there was so much discussion about how to beat Necrons. Uh, the second point is, if you don't have like the historically good players on a faction, you might not see uh, as much success at an event with them. And that can sometimes shift the results because there are players who are getting kind of 90% win rates and... You know, and the average in the meta, if we say 60% is a really strong faction, there's such a disparity between the two. And mm -hmm. the third point is you had Manny Chima on his Accursed Cultist build, which I would argue suffers from very similar counters to Necrons, yet he got all the way up to coming in fourth place. So what is the defining factor in this meta? Is it the army faction choice you take or is it the pilot and what they're using? Um, and it's a sign of a good meta when the players who are good at the game are doing very well at the game. And I think when you are looking who went 5-0 and the names that then got into top 8, like, you wouldn't be surprised with any of them making it through. Exactly. Nassim, like, I, I, I think Aiden was like the least known face for me. Mm 
-hmm. from the play players who went into quarters. But other than that, all of them were staples in the scene, winning majors before. So I don't think Mark won an event before, but like he was always around those four and one scores and performing quite well. So the top the top eight can be a little bit swingy, but if you look at four one, which is eighty percent upwards uh, on the win rate, that's a good indicator, and you'll find that most of the names you know are sitting in that bracket. Yeah. So maybe as all the our ideas around LGT will directly translate to the tier list, I might suggest unless Nathan, you have something to ask. No, I guess the only thing is, and I, they might have discussed it before, do you think the new singles meta might be plagued a little bit by armies that can just take fixed? Because looking at how when we did prep for the WTC, and actually at the event of the WTC, fixed was an occasional choice, whereas you now looked at a lot of the armies that did well, say like Naz's list, where it literally just goes, I take fixed, I get 95, can you stop me getting 95? No, I win. Is that a little bit... I know that's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but are we going to have an issue of a bit like in ninth edition when you had some armies that were going, I get 45 on secondaries or 40 on secondaries, can you do anything about it? Are we going to struggle with that now, potentially? Mm -hmm. um, I think... You've hit on another really interesting point here, which is how um, metas kind of develop based on little tactics and things which become more popular when people become aware of these kinds of things. I think what we'll probably see is an explosion of people going for fixed over, over tactical secondaries going forward from here. And, and in our minds, it'll be like, oh, we always took fixed. You know, we, for we forgot the times when we took secondaries, tactical secondaries. Yeah. In this tournament, I took fixed every single game. And I think uh, a lot of um, good players are on that line of thought now as, as time goes on. But remember when, we, when this edition first came out, we all thought like, tactical is way better. And we definitely yeah. thought that for WTC. Uh, so there are, there are multiple points where this kind of stuff comes up, where tactics are built around things when, which become popular knowledge. And I think fixed secondaries is going to be a big one, not just for singles, but just overall in 10th edition. Yeah. Yeah. I to add to that, I think at WTC we already had like few players who nearly always took fixed mm -hmm. at the same time, especially on the ritual, which is very dumb mission. Please do not include it into <laughs> map packs. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree with that. I think people would tend to get into that, but at the same time, there is a huge disparity how certain armies can play fixed mm -hmm. with how you look at tactical as another source of CC key during the game. Mm -hmm. So you need an army that generates those CP as well, which you can see in all the C in the CSM builds with Abaddon, right? You would get those two CP in your turn. And with Eldar, all of them playing way leaper because that model is still busted. So I think that yeah. makes sense that armies you see taking fixed will usually what play behind enemy lines and homers or cleanse and homers. Like basically homers plus something. Mm -hmm. And if opponent is giving out assassinate, you will play assassinate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that was very visible in all the playoffs of LGT, with most of the games being played or the fixed. And I think unless you have an army that can play tactical very well, it's easier to even build for fixed because you just have one game plan, and it's easier, especially for a very long event, to execute one game plan every round instead of having to think whether I have units in each corner, near enough to each corner, or can I do Storm Hostile or behind enemy lines next turn with how I'm the, moving this time, this turn, etc., etc. So I think there's like another benefit of playing fixed when it comes to long run events. For sure. But having said that, I am very much prepared and I hope my laptop doesn't crash. Uh, and we've got what everyone loves a tier list where we i've can never agree. done one of these so no sorry. you guys did you, you no guys did. i wasn't in it ah you see my first you time. always got to have the first time i'm <laughs> glad to be the one you have it with thank you Tyler. anyway uh so i'll try to give you armies and you guys place it and then we'll start discussion so 
let's start with the very first one. You might see a tendency. What are the very first two? Maybe like slightly. Uh, Nathan, where would you put Chaos Space Marines? To be honest, looking towards the bottom of the table, no, SD. It's not even. I think they are, they are him now. They are the number one army, I think, right now. Yeah, and obviously, I think we mostly have singles data, but I will try to steer those conversations also into teams. That's why I decided to put Eldari and Chaos Space Marines first, because I think with Vic, we're our Eldari. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Eldari are obviously S tier here. Uh, ability yeah. to push a differential, minimal bad matchups. Yeah, those two factions are right at the top here for that. Yeah, and I think at every moment we have top factions, those will dedicate the rest of the meta, especially for teams. And how we it was done for WTC, you needed to have counters for GSC and Eldar, right? You would even build the team compositions to counter GSC like you Americans did. And you can build such compositions. It dictates how you approach the team composition, how you want to do stuff. So I don't think there's too much to talk even about okay, Space Marines and Eldar. Maybe you want to add a little bit to it, like something specific. I mean, I would like Vic? to just say that I think CSM are higher than Eldari on this ranking personally, because I actually think there are multiple builds which can counter Eldari, which can blunt them. Uh, prevent them from scoring a lot whereas CSM I think have a game into absolutely everything depending on player skill um, they're going to have some matchups they don't do quite as well in but they'll always be in with it so I, I would put CSM as the best army in the game for team format at the moment yeah and I agree because Eldari could already have like very small counters at WTC and mm -hmm. we saw, saw that with Liam's Necrons and I think all oh, the Horde Necron armies are the number one idea how to counter Eldar, mm -hmm. but other Horde armies with how the devastating wounds changed can be another good counter into Eldar. Absolutely. And also Eldar suffer sometimes from being pushed <coughs> if you have good enough damage, because mm -hmm. they want to play the long game, the resources. They have Phantasm, Fire and Fates for a reason to expand CPs to trade on the board effectively without losing units. And that's something that when you are playing a game plan that just nullifies Eldar's game, game plan, suddenly they ha they are playing uphill battle. So, yeah, I, I fully agree with it. Nathan, yourself? Yeah, it's. I think you could even start playing around with CSM with when you start giving the board choice, you start giving them options to who they play against. I think they're really strong. I think their matrix overall would just look fantastic. Yeah, I, I don't see... Like at the first glance, a natural counter to CSM. I just got uh, it, it. It depends if you're looking at singles or teams. I think for teams, CSM sit at the top, but personally, I would say for singles, Eldari sit above CSM. Um, I think okay. uh, I think you'd rather be the Eldari player if those two are facing off, uh, unless you're playing Liam Bissa. <laughs> so you you mean in the context of the match between them two, you'd rather be on the Eldari side. Correct. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in teams, obviously, this is one matchup that CSM can then avoid. Yeah. And when they get their table choice and stuff, it gets even worse. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Let's go through with more of them. We've got next faction, Adeptus Custodis. Nathan, why don't C. you take this one? For me, I put okay. them about C tier. So, like, I guess we probably so have before to. Before you get into that, mm -hmm. what do you define? A, B, and C tier. How do you see armies within those tiers in context of team play? Okay, so here's how I would break down how I would assess my A, yep. B, C, D. So S tier and A tier are going to be for me, because for me, this, when I look at this as a team event, I'm looking at this as eight man. So for example, if this mm -hmm. was a four man event, I would put Necrons way lower. But as an eight-man team, I put Necrons way higher, for example. So if I'm looking at this from an eight, I would put S and A as the, these are the armies that you would probably see in most eight-man teams. Then B starts becoming the extra options. C starts becoming the 
actually, if we have a niche player or niche army and it does a niche role, I would start putting it in. D and F start being, well, these are just unlikely to be seen or in F tier. It's realistically very few teams would take these. That's kind of how I would break down. I could even I, say we could delete F tier in the context of teams. And I'll do I think that. you put custodies in F tier. I'm not even joking. I genuinely think even in an eight, that is an absolute liability to run custodies as they are at the moment. I think they have almost no good matchups and they can't push mm -hmm. a differential. No. Yeah, and I kind of agree with that. I think that custodies as an army right now <laughs> struggle with their identity. And this is something that I think we'll see quite a bit when talking about those uh, about those factions and those discussions whether certain faction fits into the team comp. Because if you have an army that does the role of one army better than the other army, suddenly that army has no place in the team. Mm -hmm. And that was very visible at WTC with multiple armies just not being present at all. And in this case, I think Custodies, like there is no reason for you to take them over Dark Angels now, over Black Templars, over CSM, like top armies. Because they do not have the damage anymore with smaller blobs. So I would I would put themselves, in my opinion, in like C or D tier. Bottom of C, top of D, yeah. Yeah, like I can see them still being played in the team and trying to go for the draws, but they remind me of what like the eighth choice that you take only if you have a player that's very versed with the army. They still have some units that are really good. Like you won't tell me that the wardens with Blade Champ are in a good unit. They are still very threatening, but they just feel like there's not enough of them on the board. And they now really want agents. And at the same time, agents are even worse for them with how more expensive they got. So it's like, what, what are we doing at this point? Yeah. So I, I agree with bottom C, top D at this point. And now, Vic, as a man that also loves this army, and uh, uh, I have my very strong opinion, and I might have my hobby goggles on me. So <laughs> I'll leave this one to you. Sisters. What do you think about sisters? I mean, I do think that they are better than maybe the meta gives them credit for. But saying that, I don't think they're good enough for any like people who are serious about trying to compete for an event to actually run. So it's going to be hard for us to analyze what the strongest builds in sisters is. But... For me personally, looking at it, I think they need a really big rules rewrite. They need their, co their codex to come out to try and bring them out of this rut that they sit in with another faction, which is usually really fun with lots of melee. Sisters used to be really fun with lots of melee, and now they, they really don't have that anymore. They just exist with a lot of stuff. Um, I'd say for a team uh, format, personally, I would actually put Sisters above Custody. I really rate Custodies very lowly for teams format. Um, I, I put them above them just for the ability to maybe hold and score a little bit and just exist, really. Um, so I'd say if custodies are in C tier, so are sisters. Yourself, Nathan, anything to add? Yeah, I think if we're talking about singles, custodes and sisters are both in D tier. In teams, you give them a little bit more benefit of the doubt when they can pick a table, they can be in more of a put-forward role, but I just don't see where they're doing the damage from. I don't really see where they're doing their primary scoring enough in quite a primary heavy mission base set, rule set we have these days. So to be honest, you could almost put Sisters and Custodes in D tier because somebody's got to go in D tier and looking at the rest of the list. Yeah. At the very end, we'll go through it once again. Yeah. And yeah. Fix all of this. Yeah. I myself, I am very biased, but I've spent way too much time with Mitch and Lamar at, w, at LGT. And I think people are very discrediting sisters at this point. This army, I think, has a lot of tricks and actual damage that is yet to be discovered. And this army suffers from the fact that most of the top players do not look at it and haven't put enough time into it. So it's still undiscovered. I would myself, I'm not even kidding, I would take it for five minutes when I looked through the matchups and how the army performs into those matchups, that it can reliably get draws from CSM and Eldari from the Go. games I've watched. 
put it in B tier. Why is it there then? That's awesome. Because, because I want to then talk what I would change at the very end. Sure. But, <laughs> but I think people are sleeping on the army. I have my hobby goggles all the way in, and I'm planning to take them to Zagreb. And I, unless you've read, if you've read Ark of Flagland's Detachment and think this army has no legs, I don't think you know what you are talking about. Forty k, <laughs> like, it's, awesome. but throwing shade. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, but I'm very biased. Anyway, next army that's not very visible on any kind of radar. I know Malik took this one, so I'll let you Vic talk about Me? Adeptus Mechanicus because you were talking with Vic. Uh, not Vic, Malik. Uh, Malik so, I Malik, haven't spoken yeah. anything with Malik. I, I I don't know, Nathan. Do you know what Admech rules are? I have no idea. <sighs> Me neither. <laughs> they 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 got a couple of little boosts from the latest update, but realistically, they got nothing really. They still their only saving grace is their ability to kill certain things in the game is just done by better people, and it just has. Not a lot going for it at the moment. It's quite a dull, overpriced as its D tier for me. Uh, I haven't seen any evidence contrary to that opinion. Uh, probably get hate in the comments from all those Admech players, but uh, hopefully there's not too many. We clearly have no clue. So. I have no idea. I, I will <laughs> gladly, actually, if you're an Admech player and you can tell us why we are wrong, please do so. Please write it in the comment, tell us why we know shit. Because I will happily learn this army because I think this army is another one that struggles from the brain attrition that the top players are not actually putting enough time. And there might be something after all the point drops. So deter because we have no clue, so we will never take it. Yeah. I think that's about fair. Yeah. And now, Vic, I think guard for you. You've been talking to David. I think the army took a massive change in how it's seen. The Skark list from WTC is no longer viable to some extent. What's your take on the army? I do still think like you can have a good amount of indirect fire, but yeah, you're right. There's been some changes to guard, and uh, I'm lucky to be in the same team and work with Dave quite a lot, so I get to see that innovation from a top player like firsthand uh, as it destroys everyone around it. And um, I think Astro Militarum still have a lot of of legs, even in singles. But I think they'll shine even more in teams because their ability to provide an armor skew, a vehicle skew that actually works, is kind of rare in this meta. Uh, no one, no other army is really doing that significantly, except maybe one other one, which we'll get to later. Um, but I think that puts them in a really good place on top of having indirect fire that's actually effective and having infantry for scoring. I think guard are in a great place, and I could see them in a lot of team compositions. Um, personally, I'd put them in A tier. Nathan, yourself, anything to add? Yeah, for me, they're A tier. I think to, if it was singles, you could maybe argue it's like B, but for me, it's A. Um, there is, uh, we haven't seen it yet, but there is definitely, like we talked about when we did the PTC episode, there is still an indirect army in there that is going to be very good into the meta. When you look at, say, a lot of these smaller, fragile MSU armies, marine profiles, those kind of armies. I don't know if even if it's just slightly less than Scott took because the points went up, but there's going to be an indirect army in there that's still great in there. Yeah, I think Skark's list loses like two indirect platforms. Yeah. From his list. So I think his list like cost 2,300 points after the... Yeah, Change. it went up to about 330, I think it was. So, like, yeah. with some tweaking, even if you had six indirect, if everybody else's stuff has also gone down in point or gone up in points, against those CSM lists, against those other lists that we might see being popular, it might still very much have its place in team. So, for me, yeah, it's still a team. And that's also something that Myson said at the Polish team championships, right? That five men, that the worst team for them during pairing was actually the least skilled one to some extent when comparing to other teams they've played against because that team had guard full of indirect and they just couldn't pair against it with their team composition and that was one of the very few armies that Liam VSL at that event didn't want to play against so you know that means something <laughs> so yeah I agree with eight here 
then we'll have plenty of marines and uh, i don't want to get too deep into marines in terms of team composition obviously you can take only one marine faction so it definitely narrows down what you're considering within the team so nathan let's get into mm -hmm. black templars they are quite hype around the world i think they were played by jack harpster this last weekend right so yes. what's your take on them especially so with the new codex maybe you took a look into the new codex already uh, i've not had a chance to really look into the new book so as it stands now they do seem to be whether they're they are putting in good results and from a singles perspective anyway and the french black templars player did quite well i personally would put them in i'm gonna say a tier because I think as it stands now, I would probably put them in A tier as one of the most viable marine options with one other on that list. Then with the new Codex, they seem to have some nice new tricks, but I think generally looking at it, when you lose four rerolls to wound, that does cut out quite a lot. I think of out of all the armies of marine armies, I think Black Templars actually live through lack of reroll to ones the best in yes. terms of their previous faction identity because they relied a lot on lethal hits and critical hits on fives so yes. that army with rerolls to hit still does what it planned to do before a little bit less effectively but still effectively so i think they are not hit as hard as some other factions where they are still not playing on gladius right so yeah i think they can almost lethal hit their way out of most options, unlike some of the other newer marine factions. In this. Vic? So for me, they're a tier. Vic? Oh, I don't really... I'm learning stuff as I'm listening to you guys. There's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff in indexes which I'm like not really exposed to, to be honest, and Marines is one of them. So, I mean, I, I obviously look at tournament results and things. I get sent pictures of someone running like 100 Black Templars bodies and it seems quite skewy. Um, I did play against uh, a few marine factions, but definitely not Black Templars. So I'm going to leave that up to your expertise. Yeah, I'm not super sold on marines in general. Mm -hmm. I think we can kind of skip to the one that's really powerful, and that's Dark Angel still. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of team composition, at least in my opinion, when we are talking about marines, we need to include which of them is actually the one that you will take the most. Mm -hmm. And I think out of all the Marines, we can consider Dark Angels the best, then we can consider Black Templars, as Olivier was playing them at WTC, and now he was playing Raven Guard for his own sake. But he's, he's a madman. And I think overall in Marines, there's only those two factions. Maybe New Book will bring something else. Like I seen people running the full tank list, but we don't have enough data. So for now, I'll allow myself the power mm. to actually show the other Marine factions at the same time. And we can maybe go through them as we disagree, putting Dark Angels top as the best Marine faction in A. I think we agree on that one together. And uh, then Black Templars would be a little bit lower. I myself do not see, haven't seen as much of Black Templars, but maybe Vicky will add a little bit why Dark Angels are the best Marines by far. Uh, I don't know, really. It's just the one everyone's running. Uh, I'm not fully sure what's particularly special about them, to be honest. Uh, uh, run me through the rules. Well, that's definitely nice. In Gladius, so this sure. is I, I very against the Deathwing Knights. The the so thing is, I that's think all of it. That, that's all of it. That's all of it. Because I play T Suns and Eldar, <laughs> it's not really a problem because they just never that, move anywhere. <laughs> yeah, but the fact is that Deathwing Knights are just a defining unit for this whole archetype, sure. as the aggressors in the land raider can be fielded in any marine factions as long as you're playing Gladius. Deathwing Knights are what defines this army. And this is like the fighting blood, the one that can take the brunt of damage and still dish out damage. So I think the whole idea is that you have that one unkillable block, as long as you're not playing against Eldari, 
you'll be fine against CSM. It can be more touch and go. But at WTC, this army performed well into CSM. Mm -hmm. And I think both of them got discounts and got better. So I think it should be still around draw, which may be slightly favored for the new CSM builds. Does it also not just die to things like Tau or Votan and things like that? Or not really? The Deathwing Knights survive that stuff. Yeah, the problem is if you are two up safe and now that Armor of Contempt is Battle Tactic, mm -hmm. so you get that cover Armor of Contempt, so then you're not dying as fast. Sure. Okay. Of, like Tau, if you run the maths, Deathwing Knights are the worst thing you can shoot with Tau because on average you kill three. Oh, really? With the full crisis, bro. Even with AP2 ignore cover on three ups, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, because they have three up save. So you're mm. wounding them on freeze, and mm. then they are saving on freeze, and suddenly you're only killing like three or four of them. Okay. With right. your whole unit shooting once, and then you can usually die from the retaliation. So it's not great. Uh, so yeah, I think they're, they're, that's where the power lies, and that's why we took them to WTC as well because that unit is just powerful. I yeah. well, if you battle shock the Deathwing Knights, then well, you're very skillful because we just got a comment <laughs> that you can do that. Obviously, you can, it's not really that easy <laughs> to actually incorporate into the game to some extent, but yeah, I think th this is quite powerful. And I think losing Thunderfire Cannon will also impact a little bit matchups into certain armies because suddenly you lose the slow that was quite potent in the Marine build. Mm -hmm. And we know based on the Eldar that slow is a very powerful tool that you can have in your faction. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think the new book will be more interesting. Now, I will allow myself to reshuffle more Marines to the top so we can actually talk about more Marines and then get into the actually interesting factions instead of the poster boys. And, uh, well, maybe let's start with Deathwatch. Does no, anyone disagree uh, with putting them in C slash D? They're C, D now. So it's kind of like if we want to look at Marines, because you can only pick one for teams, I guess we kind of pick the two or three that are available and the rest basically fall quite far down is how I'd put them. Just because yeah. if they're not being taken over the two viable factions of Marines, then they're not worth taking, if that kind of makes sense. And Death Watch especially because they're the FAQ absolutely humped them and they can't do anything now. Like this. Yeah, they surely That's deserve the control. worst beating in the balance, right? Out of all the factions, uh, they yes, deserved it. Yeah. yeah. Poor Death Watch. I would not take Death Watch in the team, straight up. If yeah. I am thinking about Marines, Death Watch doesn't fill in any niche in the team that I would rather have them do rather than other armies. Because they might have the mobility, the jumping around, but at this time, you'd rather take Grey Knights if you're looking for that tech, right? So I don't see a reason to take Deathwatch. Maybe you disagree with me at this point, Vic. I think Deathwatch was quite bad at WTC already. So Yeah, it was. I mean, I, what I would say is you saw Oliver take uh, Raven Guard. You took, saw Alejandro at WTC take Blood Angels. Yeah. I think uh, fundamentally, Space Marines have some okay units in there. And if you combine them in an intelligent way, it doesn't matter what the sub-faction is. You can, you can play them to some decent level. Um, but for the purposes of a team's tier list, I agree with what Nathan said. You, you just pick the best sub-faction, and it's clear that Dark Angels and Black Templars kind of sit in a higher level of popularity than the others. How about Blood Angels, Nathan? I think they got a little bit of a glow-up with the changes. They did. They got some nice points decreases. But I do worry a little bit with the Blood Angels because they didn't have any other unique units losing the desolators in that list did hurt a lot i think for their overall matrix uh if we're looking at the new book losing real to wounds on those death company power fists might be not death for them but that strength nine is not great into a more if it does become a bit more vehicle heavy i would float them around the c bracket because i just don't feel like they're any stronger than dark angels in space uh Black Templars. 
I think they are still very good. They've got some nice little tech in there and they got, went down some points. But again, I don't see them being stronger. No, I agree. I, but would you that take them sense. over Custodies? I think. Oh, yeah. Um, I agree with that. I will put them below Sisters because I'm biased as fuck. <laughs> uh, and then Vic, how about the wolves? Space wolves. Okay, I think space wolves are. I'm gonna put them on in D tier, with a complete lack of knowledge of any marine rules, <laughs> as you can obviously tell from this. Yeah. I have no I, idea what marines do. I just play I, I them and ask them like what does this do. Few nice units. The thunder wolves going down to thirty points per model is actually quite a steal when you consider what they can do. Massive move blocks, kind of chunks of yeah. stuff in the middle. Yeah, so I don't think there's... And their Saga's detachment is, I think, the worst one in the game. But yeah, I would consider Wolves and Deathwatch kind of on the same level. If you're looking for melee marines, just go for Templars or Dark Angels because they can, if they see a wall, they just do not howl into the moon hoping that wall falls down. They just push through it, which is a big, powerful mechanic when you're infantry. But other than that, regular Marines, I think with regular Marines, you have few ideas nowadays. I saw that in the new detachment with the new battle tile, the Dev Wounds on Flamers. You can build like a true salamanders list, or you can actually go for something like the tank spam that's also running around with the sustained hits detachment, if I'm not mistaken. So I think the regular marines are probably somewhere in the B tier, and I would be looking into that development. I think whenever we talk about all the marine factions, this is the point where we know the least about the factions. So you just we cannot give good enough answers yet. Maybe in like two, within a month, we'll probably know well enough. At least in Poland, we'll have two team events till that time. So we'll get a better grasp what people will figure out with the Marines. Do you have anything against putting them in say B tier yeah, as a average. generic statement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, until we know more, yeah. To be confirmed. Uh, my phone just decided to not help me out with talking, so I should be back. Yeah. Uh, what were you saying about the Marines in B tier? Anything against it? No. Just made a little pun saying to be confirmed. Uh, Chaos Demons. Uh, well, Chaos Demons, if we consider them as allies, I think they are S tier, no discussion. Sure. As a standalone army, they are, uh, well, C slash D. They've got some good units, but I just don't think those units are that... Like, I think if you actually go more down the the Blood Thrones and Blood Crusher route, the actual damage output is fantastic on those units. But the problem is that's very good into crashing into elite armies. But you look at the elite armies now, and there are, there isn't that many... You don't have the rerolls to wounds to kill tanks. You don't want to really run into a Wraithguard blob because with minus one to wound, you are winning on fives, um, sixes, for half of it. So it's just one of those, your army is not MSU enough. So yeah, they're kind of like, for me, I'm biased. I'd want them towards high C tier, but yeah, just, I think... If we're looking at it purely from a team's list, they are C or D because if you take a solo demons faction, you can't stick demons into another faction, which yeah. improves CSM, which improves CK, which we'll talk about later. Yeah. So from my point of view, I would put them straight bottom of D if we're talking about them as a solo faction because you just hinder your two powerful armies that you would take into the team. Vic, your take on it? Yeah, I agree with you. I think they're very strong as allies, but I, I think there is a world where if you just consider that they can't be allies, let's pretend, and we look yeah. at them on their own as a faction, 
I think, you know, they had some nice, interesting points drops, and I'd like to see someone create something with it. Celeste is obviously great now. Burning Chariot's got a nice points drop to them. Um, it'll be it'll be really interesting to see how they do in singles, but for the purposes of this tier list, I agree with you. They are just phenomenal in CSM. Yeah, this is weird enough, but I think for teams, they are the worst army <laughs> as a solo faction. No. Not as bad as Custodes. I, I mean... <laughs> You're not making your other armies weaker by taking them. <laughs> You're making your team weaker. Yeah, but <laughs> but not other armies. So I think this is a completely different level of your kneecapping yourself. Like, come on. Right. Uh, now about kneecapping yourselves. Uh, Nathan, Death Guard. So this is one of the ones me and Josh had a fight about because I put them D tier. And Josh is like, oh, no, actually, they've got some... They've got some decent indirect. They've got some skill to them now that they've got the balance update. But until I'm proven otherwise, as for me, they're still D tier, maybe bottom of C tier. But if somebody, please prove me wrong. I I don't I haven't seen them enough. I haven't played with them. I'm kind of going off what we've seen, and I don't think they got. You didn't look at the balance update and go. Like with one of the factions we'll talk about later, you don't look at the balance update and go, oh, Death Guard are back in it now. And then we didn't see that many at LGT doing proficiently well. There's no 5 and O's. There wasn't that many 4 and 1s. So I don't currently have a reason to believe that they are better than bottom of C or top of D. I think the problem with Death Guard is still the thing that was their problem in previous edition, and that is your opponent being able to use measure tape. If your <laughs> yes. opponent knows how to measure 17 or 20 inches, you suddenly cry. Yeah, yeah. And that's the problem with the faction identity overall. Mm -hmm. So, Vic, your opinions? Yeah, I agree with you. I also think it's because of that, it's an army that doesn't attract good players to it. And saying that, I've heard some rumblings about Death Guard. I haven't seen them like uh, really put on the board too much at all. But uh, you know, if you can do your approach correctly and apply pressure correctly, you you can get even these slow armies where they need to be. It just requires some really careful play to do that. So uh, I think Death Guard might end up surprising people eventually at some point. Uh, but I, I'm not convinced that. Uh, you know, I'm like you, Nathan. I'm not fully convinced that they're going to get through the very best players in the world. Actually, yeah, I think I might caveat it a little bit. I would maybe put them in, say, C, because they might actually, with the points drops that they did have, they might now be quite good at the fixed game. Oh, yeah. Well, the second fixed, I mean, I guess they? Clans and Homers. Yeah. They don't seem like a behind enemy lines faction to me. Oh, <laughs> definitely not. No. They're not dynamic enough. But a cleanse and a again, it's a faction that is vastly improved by taking demon allies. But no, if we're just talking standalone, yeah, even just nurglings help you do cleanse. They help you do um, what's it called? Beacons, not beacons. Homers. Teleport. Homers. Homers. Um, but yeah, so. Maybe there's an army there, but I haven't seen it yet. I'm still yet to see. I think this is somewhere around Custodies as in faction identity at this point. Like, kind of slow. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like, okay, damage in melee nowadays, but they feel very similar to Custodies, at least for me. So I would put them somewhere in C. Mm -hmm. Maybe above Custodies, because we don't know what they will do yet, and they actually have some decent indirect in them. Um, have platforms in terms of plug burst crawlers while custodies have jack shit in that sense. Mm -hmm. So well there's that, but I'm yet to see like if we were going with our initial feelings before with not knowing a faction, this would probably end up in D. And I think this is a problem. Like we might be talking about factions, but as soon as you identify in the team composition which armies are worth taking a deeper look into we cause more brain attrition from certain factions because we realize that there might be like 10, 11 factions that we might consider for the team. But then we do not look into the others because we simply do not have the brain power to analyze all of them. And about armies that are not worth analyzing, we have Drukhari. <laughs> oh, poor Drukhari. 
Dr- Drakari are one of those armies that look amazing on paper. Like you look at it, you build a list, you're like, how many Dark Lances do you have? Yeah, I think so. I think you build the list and it looks good. And then you look at the rules and then you see how it plays on the board. And you're just like, really? That you don't have fallback and shoot? Like, what stratagems do you even have? And, you know, why do you just not do anything? <laughs> and um, I think they're an army which is phenomenally bad on the board relative to how, you know, you... I, I know a few people are quite excited that Drakari might be okay. There's some builds in there, but they just don't function when you actually put them on the board, unfortunately. And I don't think the balance data scale has really changed. They don't have any push units. Which feels really weird with the faction when you know what they were doing in nine. That just seems absurdly wrong when you consider that. Yeah, they don't really yeah. trade. They have some nice little tech pieces for scoring and doing a bit of damage here and there, especially anti tank, but they don't really trade. They don't really push. It's not an ideal situation for teams or singles. Yeah. And they are Did very win. table reliant because the whole projection rule on those models can sometimes oh, be very okay. painful. Mm. Did win a large tournament in Australia. There you go. A couple of weeks ago. Upside down. Let's flip flip this over for Australia meta. But then uh, Chaos Demons are the best. <laughs> but no, like yeah, they they're just struggling again. They're, if you were going to chuck some in your Eldar in your Elder Army, they might make them a little bit better in certain places. But yeah, I think they are. There's a there's a dark lance spam in there. If the meta becomes very vehicle heavy, it might have a place. But realistically, it's CD again. I think it's in D tier. I would just not consider it for the team. Straight yeah. up, and that's what D tier is for me. <laughs> sure. And D tier, I'm not really considering that. What is where in that? Yeah, but now another faction that I think also ha- starts to have brain attrition, and mm-hmm. that's GSC. That faction I still think is really powerful. It just plays the every game the same way. Now you just drop, kill, hope they died, maybe go back, drop once again, and kill once again. And I know Myson was very upset with how the army plays now compared to previous edition. Mm. So what's your take on GSC, Vic? Mm. I, I mean, I would agree with you. I think that, you know, they have a very one-dimensional play style. It's much easier as an opponent to manage manage them and screen them out and accept, look, I'm going to get hit here, not accept, like, over two turns, my whole army is dead. And I think you can really start pushing them on the score and things. And also now it feels like before they punished you for your mistakes and they still do to an extent, but now you really punish GSC for their mistakes. And I think one little mistake and they're just not keeping up on anything scoreboard or units on the board. So I think GSC have taken a bigger hit than I thought they'd taken, to be honest. I thought, look, you've still got these ridiculous demolition charges, which you can take a million off. And you've got these cool little tricks with your Goliath truck, whatever. You do loads of damage. Uh, but actually, they're much easier to deal with now. Yeah. My son was, after Polish Team Championship, he was saying that after the changes, he felt like every game he lost three differential points. Like his games, instead of being 15 5, became 12 8. Mm. And that the army just. At WTC, it already wasn't a high scorer. Like it was a consistent 13 14 point scorer rarely getting more points and now it's even worse where the army if it will win it will always win like 11 12 points if your opponent knows to play assassinate and homers into it they will nearly always score 35 points from those two and you can do not much about it so i think the army even for teams play has less of a news now because it's more of a cog block in terms of pairings rather than something you'd actually use to push an advantage and outwear your opponent. So I would myself put it in B. I think this army is still good, but it's nowhere near I want to include it in the team immediately. It's more like an army that I would consider for seventh, eighth spot right now. Yeah. Nathan, something to add? Yeah, I think GSC, with the volatility of... I think if you were playing like seven rounds in ETC, 
if you take GFC one of those rounds, you could have your score go from 13 to 6 because you literally go, I've got three units to bring back and none of them came back. And you just go, uh, that's or one of them comes back and it goes, well, there, there goes half my game plan. I still think they have a very big use into certain armies in a matrix where they just go, if I go first with the infiltrate and block your army, there's very little you can do. Um, I think they're still really good into Eldar. I still think they're good into Eldar. So they might... I think they're way better than they were at WTC. Yes, they're much better into the more MSU version of Eldar than the Double Wraith Knight, obviously, because that was anything with good save and minus one damage, like Tyranifexes or whatever, were a nightmare for them. But yeah, I'd still put them in B tier. They still have a place. They still do actually have good damage. People don't want to run into them. They still have a lot of horde. They still have a lot of abilities to block. They're still quite good at cards. Um, they struggle a little bit because they give up fixed even easier. So if you build your list to do fixed in some ways, they can go assassinate and cleanse or assassinate and beacons. But then not always that sometimes a trap the other way around because the GSC player might go, cool, I'll stick all seven characters behind the terrain piece. And you go like a zero for characters. But they don't and, usually can afford that because they need to kill no. opponents and without Primuses in those squads and then the damage output just drops. That is awesome. Because, you know, you're hitting on fives with sustained hits, then those rerolls are really powerful. Mm -hmm. And if you're not having those rerolls, then your damage output just cripples nearly by double. But if you're trying so, to do a draw, taking 20 points off your opponent is a pretty good start. So, yeah, yeah I can see it both ways. Yeah. I think their role is if you in your team don't have an idea how to counter Eldar and you are scared of them defending with Eldar quite early, I think you can take GSC into your team comp. But it is more of a case if you have your first five, six armies chosen, whether you want to go this route. Yeah, and to add to that, I think what, like you just said there, the usefulness to go into Eldar without having to use necessarily one of your better factions is useful. Because you can go GSE rather than having to go, uh, I'll have to use, I don't know, CSF or I'll have to use Blood and Blood. Fill in blank. I think this is a case if you have a faction specialist that's really good with the army. So say we had Mison, you have Eric Laturas in Australia, etc. You just let them play this. Because I think at this point there will be another benefit that the armies that will be built will not count, like account for countering GSC as much. So sure. they will get indirectly slightly better, but they are not immediately like very powerful. They are still really good, but I would only take them if I knew that one of my players is a great player of that faction. Then, Grey Knights. Vic, do you want to take on the Grey Knights? What's your I, take on them? So I found it really interesting that Jack brought Grey Knights to WTC. That like really opened up a lot of our eyes to some of the tricks that Grey Knights can do. And uh, I think they've only got better off with a balanced data slate. And, uh, really great points reductions for them. Now, I, I, I do think that they actually could comfortably make an eight um uh, at their current power level i think they're a very good army and i think as people continue to practice and use them um they'll see the strengths of them the movement manipulation the difficulty to actually get to grips with them they can consistently score a good number of points so i still think they have some weaknesses their output profiles are still a little bit questionable into anything with high toughness uh, but, you know, you can build around it now that you have a few more points. You can get some devastating wounds in there a bit easier and things. So um, I think or Grey Knights are... triple librarian. Yeah, the triple librarian build. Suddenly you have more stuff around it rather than having to go full on like what Jack did. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of the Grey Knights. And I think I hope to see them a lot more in singles as well. And I think we did at LGT. We saw a fair few Grey Knight players do decently. Yeah, um, some of one of them went five zero, and I saw a lot of them yeah. being in that four zero games, but then losing in in the fifth round. They were all up there, and you know, I, whatever I ran, if I brought CSM or Eldari, I'd be a little bit concerned to try and deal with a good Grey Knights player. 
Um, yeah. So I think you could definitely include uh, them in your team event if you have a good player to use them. Nathan, where would you put them? Yeah, um, for me, it's going to be like a top of B, A. So for me, like S and A are kind of like, these are definitely going to be taken. GK, I think, is a little bit, you need a player well-versed. They lost a little bit. They gained in some points, but they lost. What strat did they lose? You can't double it up with characters now. So that made them a little bit weaker, I think, didn't it? In some maneuverability. You have to reshape the list a little bit. I, I think so, you cannot use mists for free. That's the difference. That was the one, yeah. Um, which is which does you still it. use every time. Every yeah. turn. Yeah. So it's kind of one but of those... To be fair, doubling up with characters wasn't as useful with Grainers because they had only once per game out of yes. all the armies. So mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd A, B. Say. I think head. above Black Templars. Okay, yeah, I agree with that. Oh, yeah. Rory in the comments says that they lost free loan ops strat. Ah, that's sad. And that's that true. it costs two CP, so it's pretty much of the table with mists plus rapid ingress economy that you need to play every turn. So we are close to what we were saying, but we had no clue as well. That's great that we didn't play Jack at the WTC. <laughs> Me and Nathan making the smart move and not playing at all to not get embarrassed. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I think the army is good. I would say this is another case you need to have a good player on it because the army is very skill dependent. Uh, so, I would put it in a similar area as GSC. At least they do not strike me as an army that when I see it, I immediately want to play it. I still see it has some problems, but it can play well into, say, Eldari as well. Right, that WTC already it was their plan. And I can see this army being another cog block kind of an army in the pairings that can play into most stuff. I think this will be also visible in the singles that they will usually win, but very small margins because they sacrifice too much primary playing their scoot off. I'll be on the other side of the board game plan. Mm. So I'll put it. Probably more teams will take them over GSC. Yeah. So that's my take. Whereas I think GSC are a better army in teams, but it's my opinion. Uh, then, Imperial Agents. Well, that's one. If we want to go with the way we did Demons, they are S tier. Yeah. Is that even an army? <laughs> Legally, according to the rules in the game, mm. it's not because you cannot legally choose a detachment for them. Whereas if you can take Chaos Knights or Imperial Knights, it specifically says that you do not need to choose a detachment when building that army. But So you can play anything oh. and just build a weird <laughs> version. So Imperial Agents, officially, by the rules, cannot build an army. But at LGT, there was one madman playing pure... Come on, what a hero. Imperial agents, and no one dared to just tell him that he cannot <laughs> play his free inquisitorial henchman squads with free inquisitors, because who is such a bad human being to say that? So, so I, I think for the team composition, whenever you are taking any Imperial army, you will always include Imperial agents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of the similar to the Chaos Demons, but even more so. Yeah. Because <laughs> it it's really a non-functional army. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think if you are... Stated. Yeah. If you take Mar Chaos Space Marine, I mean, Dark Angels or Guard or Grey Knights, you will... Or Imperial Knights, which I think is a bad choice nowadays, you will always take some kind of a agent in there. Like, you will not say no to Kalidus. And probably mostly Kalidus. So I think this is an, just a faction that depends whether you take any Imperial Army with your within your team comp, and I think you nearly always take it. So we could say it's it's S tier because it will make their place in every team composition that will be there. But if you disagree with me, where would you put it <laughs> using that logic? If that LGT guy was to come into our team, where would he put it? So he put it as S tier, but I think it probably is closer to the D tier. 
Yeah, for I, me, I it's there's... D-tier, technically. Yeah. Yeah. I think we need to put it somewhere around Chaos Demons. <laughs> I think it's better than Chaos Demons. <laughs> Uh, yeah. No, let's let's be honest. You cannot build <laughs> yeah. this as an army. I think you can even make an argument that any Imperial army can live without Kalidus. There are some niche things, like depending on the ruling, you can play Kyria Draxus in some of the Imperial armies to get that loan up on two up or stuff like that. But I don't think they are nowadays as much of a necessity because if you look at certain armies, they will usually have other resources that do not make Imperial agents and necessity within their team comp. Guard has Gaunt's Ghosts. Grey Knights just run around the table anyway. So there's not as much of a power in that. Maybe some kind of marine lists will take Kalidus for that teleport around to a mission. But even in Custodius, you would probably take her. But in Sisters, you can take her or not because you have so much chaff in Sisters that by in the price point of Kalidus, you can bring nearly three squads. So, yeah. so I think putting it in detail, weirdly enough, I think only if you are playing knights, you really, really want agents nowadays. All the other factions can live without it because Kalidus is still really good, but they have replacements within them. So they can live without it. And now about knights. I think they are D tier. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Josh did pretty well with those. Is that Chaos Knights I, as well? I think this is Imperial Knights. Imperial. Oh no, we do not have Chaos Both, Knights right? here. Oh no. Oh, no. We've been lied by the tier maker. So, above S tier. Okay. So it, Imperial Knights, I would wager, are somewhere in D tier. I think they are really bad yeah. now. Yeah, they're awful now. Like, especially if you have those models, you might as well magnetize the weapons and play them as Chaos Knights. Yeah. Uh, and Chaos Knights will just work better in the current state because they can ignore the thing called walls. And that's a really powerful mechanic. So I think if we were to look at it, Imperial Knights would be somewhere in D tier. But about Chaos Knights, Nathan, well, me and you, we're both Chaos Knights aficionados, so maybe it's your time to shine and tell us why the okay. dogs are the way. So, IK, top of D tier, the better than Adeptus mechanic is. Now, here's a bit of a shout. I think CK are in S tier with demon, with demon allies. Without demon allies, they're in A tier. So, if we have a quick look at CK, look at their matrix. Say Manny's version of CSM, CK is favoured, versus the general CSM MSU list. Uh, the MSU list wins, but I would say a, C a decent get the reps in that CK might be able to get it to seven to eight points potentially. Uh, it beats Elder, it beats Necrons, it beats Dark Angels. It I disagree with Tau. Dark Angels, but I disagree well. with Elder. <laughs> I haven't seen it lose to Elder a lot. Josh beat both of his by over 40 points. Matt Morsoli beat three Elder armies by over 40 points. Granted, mm -hmm. I need to see it against maybe top-level competition, but Josh didn't feel uncomfortable playing Elder at all. You basically just run around the Wraith Guard block. You double Wraith Guard, you lose too horribly. Uh, say Naz's list, you'd lose horribly to that. But single Wraith Guard block, it, Josh was like, this feels fine. And Matt Morsoli's had the same results. So I actually feel like it's pretty good into Eldar. It's good into Imperial Guard if it's gone indirect heavy. It's generally pretty good into Marines. It's great into Grey Knights. Great into GSC. And its matrix looks pretty comfortable. Tau don't love Armor 10 on mass. But think it's awful into uh, Votan. Votan smashes it. Fine. But that can also go badly for Votan if you have a bad shooting phase because they don't have a plan B. It's pretty good into Tyranids. So I, overall, its matrix is good. It's positive on the whole. So I think there are S. two things that are like bad, bad for them in my opinion. That's Chaos Space Marines in like Liam VSL version. That's one of those that's just bad. 
And the other one I strongly feel about the Dark Angels ver- matchup because we had that happen also at WTC. And that was comfortable 15-5 for Lashu against Jonathan, for Slay Johnson from the mm, Swedish team. So I think this matchup is also quite good for Dark Angels, but at the same time, the new book will come out. And suddenly, if you lose Oaths, yeah. it can be pain. Don't know. Yeah, I don't know. So yeah, sorry. I mean, yeah, Dark Angels, I'm wrong about that. General Marines now doesn't feel too bad into them. Uh, feels pretty good, really. So I'm, but I'm a, I'm a massive CK Dick Rider. So. I'm very, very biased. Oh so. You can't you can't bring me as a guest on this podcast <laughs> and put any form of knights in S tier while I'm here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I I agree with Nathan in terms of it should be around A tier. Like they can play so many armies nowadays that it's just dumb. They feel really, really powerful. And there is also one another thing that if you're playing singles, most of the players are not used to that kind of pressure. Like they will just not know how to play into it. So this is what I think will happen when you have Chaos Knights and you're considering it for WTC. You will put them on the table and then it'll be like, oh, this army looks really, really good. And then it will lose over and over again in practice against good players, in my opinion. That's it. That's, that's just how I think. I think it's so easy to just pick a section of the board, block them off so they can't move, kill a section of the board, and then just pick them apart. It's uh, not as easy with their strat, to be honest. One unit, one one knight can move through. Two war dogs, 14 inches move. Whatever. Chaos knights, <laughs> not for me. <laughs> Matt scored over 100 points at the WTC with it. It's fine. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think they are good. I think they are a staple within the team comp because they can bully armies. And they are one of the few armies that can stat check you with vehicle stat line. Yeah. So, what? and they do not care about the terrain, which I think is the biggest thing for them because the when you compare the Chaos Knight to an Imperial Knight, the damage difference is just dumb. And I think this is a point where we can touch upon the comment that we've got, how can Imperial Knights be so long when they won the South African Nationals Tournament? So the main thing is, in my opinion, is that Chaos Knights have two very, both Carnivores and Brigands. Brigands are the best shooting baby knight in the game, better than anything Imperial Knights can field. And Carnivore is the best melee knight in the game, better than anything Imperial Knights can field as well. And both of those can ignore terrain, and they have respective 2 plus ballistic skill and 2 plus weapon skill. So they just will usually hit hard with those 6 attacks in melee or melt and chain cannon. So I think this army will be very good. I think it will lose sometimes, but I'm really agreeing with Nathan here. I think people are sleeping on them. I would seriously consider them even for fives nowadays. But you, you can, you are free to be wrong, Vic. Like I won't I say. Prob- I am probably wrong. I have a feeling I'm wrong. <laughs> All the evidence is pointing against me. But uh, I, by evidence, you mean two nice. two people trying to be smart who haven't got into top eight at LGT, who right? Clearly, <laughs> know better than me <laughs> as well. Surely, <laughs> on we this do. topic. <laughs> Surely we Josh do. Josh would have made top eight if Manny didn't do Manny things. Oh, he got Manny. That happens. It was yeah. <laughs> I've, I've heard I've Josh ran me through it and I was just like, that makes absolutely no sense how Manny was able to do that. But okay, fine. It's it's because Chaos Whatever. Knights shouldn't be A tier, you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I'll concede uh, they're not S tier, but I'll I think they're a strong. I, d- I don't think they are S tier, but they are they have do not they don't have as many roles as well, so this army will be very susceptible to getting unlucky. Okay. I find. It so can snowball. Yeah. Uh, then Good. Leagues of Votan. Oh, Leagues of Votan. Vic, yeah, you start very happy about the short, stumpy boys. What's your oh. take on that? There's a there's a picture on the internet of me like 
<laughs> walking around with like 10 boxes of leagues of votan in my arms <laughs> i i um i sold them to someone and now i've just <laughs> bought them back the exact same amount from that same person so um <laughs> i think leagues of votan are really good uh they've got a few very pushed units now um the the rules got better the points got better and they have a couple of premium units in the the heart guard terminator guys and the sagittor i think both are really top tier units that you can build an army around and once you get a couple of units like that you can just make your army flow from that quite easily so i think we're going to see votan really explode in popularity uh the list building is straightforward i think the playstyle isn't too complicated um and i just think they're overall very strong just across the board i'm not i don't think they're the best army in the game or anywhere near that but i think they'll be great in the team composition i think there if you look at the sagittar profile this is straight up the best transport in the game oh it's crazy yeah it's it's got shooting it's got scout it's a transport it has toughness it's got toughness 10, if I'm not mistaken. Nine wounds, toughness 10. So you even, because it's got one less wound, it's even less points for like, bring it down. down. So the, the list doesn't. I've played against it six times in the last month or so. The I think the singles list, depending on the terrain and the team list, are two different things. Both have six Sagittars. I think the WTC version probably has double half guard, and you might even put some Berserkers in just for or more the bikes. terrain yeah or some bikes whereas maybe the singles version with the lighter terrain you probably do go down the multiple one to two fortresses uh and you maybe stick to one half but yeah i think votan are fantastic now they i'd argue they went from worst to best in the um update yeah Nice. Like I think they are straight up somewhere in the upper half of A tier. They just look very powerful. They have enough units to play the game. They can play the fixed game plan quite easily. Danny played Votan at LGT and he was playing the 20 half guard version and he went 5 and 0, losing then to Guillaume with Eldar, where he says that's one of the just bad matchups. Yeah, I can't play Eldar. Sadly. Yeah, but still, like that army felt really powerful with the fact that they just flood the midboard, and it was very similar to what I remember from the orcs played by US. It just had more shooting, and by shoot more shooting, I mean any shooting. So I, I think this army is like somewhere around Chaos Knights level. I think it's for me, it feels a little bit weaker than Chaos Knights, just because if they play against each other, I'd favor Chaos Knights. But that's kind of all to it. Hmm. Nathan, Vic, anything to add about? And the heart, the the models look quite cool, like the ones which are good now. So I'm very happy. Disagree. The Sagittar I... is like this big, and the uh, little Terminator hate... guys are so cute. <laughs> I I think they are the worst aesthetic in the game. I just the dislike Terminators? them so much. No, no. no. I uh, oh, you see the land. I might be compensating or anything. I just don't like that. The, when you look at them for the first time, when they are built and painted, you're like, "Is this real? Like, are they this small? Like, this is Gretchen, not a warrior. Yeah, like, this... why this thing has five toughness? Like, <laughs> what what's going on here?" Why is everything so bubbly? They look like bubble tea. They just I don't get them. They just look cartoony and weird. Fair but the rules are cool. Rules are cool. Mm. Sagittarius. Rock and no, stone. Sagittarius was. Rock and stone. The Sagittar and the Terminators look cool. Those are the only two. I'll give you the tag, not the Terminators. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Moving forward. Orcs. An army that I think also suffers from not having enough very good players playing them. Where would you guys put the orcs? Vic, you go first. I think you're right. I think orcs could do with more people like playing them. Um, and you hear uh, it, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, get off Eldar, do something more fun. Uh, 
Um, I think orcs are have a lot of tools in them, but and they can create a threat saturation list, very much like what Team USA ran to some to a lot of success. Um, from a singles perspective, I think they struggle uh, because there are like multiple things and multiple play styles with orcs struggle against. Just stuff which runs at you with no guns. Sometimes some people can just deal with that. Um, but in teams, I think there's some really good orc builds out there. You can incorporate a bit of shooting with the flash kits now. I quite like that. And, uh, you know, maybe people lean towards a little bit of damage from the knobs instead of just complete threat saturation. But I think the Team USA build still works really, really well. Yeah. Our one of our previous national team players at Polish Team Championship took like the horde version orcs. By horde, I mean spam MSU spam in vehicles, so yep. not horde. I don't know why I said horde. And he performed quite well. I think he got like 94 out of 100 points with that faction, just denying all the points available to his opponents. Because if you cannot get out of your deployment zone, it's hard to score, score primary or secondary. So you know, yeah, I think this is another army that I would just straight up take into eight men's. Yeah, right now. Okay. Uh, I have an interesting question for you guys. Yeah, orcs with board choice can it play CSM? Does it trade into CSM well? Because is he going to get chosen out to charge trucks? No. Does he get them out to charge five boys or ten boys on an objective and then gets charged by knobs in return or boy squads or anything else? Can it actually be one of those put forwards that actually goes without Wraith Knights? Orcs probably can still get point decent points out of Eldar. No. Might actually get decent points out of CSM? I don't know. What do you guys think? So Maybe you can trade. Uh, I, I Anthony, think do... are you listening? Can you join in the chat and say your points on it? <laughs> I think they do better into CSM than they will do into Eldari. Because the points that you made, it's completely fair. Like, um, maybe, but I think L CSM just have the straight up damage output to go through that. Okay. Maybe. I think Eldari have the uh, move block and movement control to pick that apart. Uh, so I would not say it competes against the top tier of factions, especially when played by a good player. It's it's way okay. too easy to play around orcs, I think, uh, when if you have those kinds of armies. Uh, but against everything else, you know. Hmm. Okay. But then yeah. let's take Leagues of Otan and CK. Would you not say that CK and Leagues of Otan are favored? And suddenly now you're in a very bad meta where or it's a bit hostile for the orcs. Orcs is an interesting one, actually, because we uh, we played some games at my house and Courtney played Josh, and actually it was kind of a draw, slightly in favour of Votan with the Orcs. Granted, the Orcs went first. If that's Votan still has a little bit with the scouts and everything else and table choice. Because the only thing with Votan a little bit is if they're playing on a super heavy table, Sagittarius become a little less effective. If you can't get the scout bonus off, being able to hit fire lanes and such... Uh, so that's they still have a little bit of a if they go oh for example Josh took Votan to the Invitational played Mycen Mycen went first had an infiltrate unit blocks him in the whole game but it still ended seventy eight to seventy so mm -hmm. yeah I'd be interested to see where Votan's matrix ends up being because the Orc matrix probably hasn't changed a crazy amount everyone else I guess has changed around it so. But no, I think, I think Orcs are definitely, if you get a good enough Orc player, it's definitely making quite they can put in, They can put the pressure as the Chaos Knights can or Votan can to some extent as well. So I think in general, when you look at the armies that we were talking and we were like saying that they were good, like CSM, Chaos Knights, Orcs, those armies have something in common, right? They just push the board and create a lot of pressure, pushing you off the markers. And I think that's where the value is. And I think this army will still perform. I'm curious how it will work with the potential knobs and stuff. And by the way, in the chat, Anthony just said that, in his opinion, Oryx got rocked by CSM when he was playing mainly to plus save at WTC. But I think, to some extent, I think it translates as well. Like. 
So then the your five men chosen with all the buffs can kill two ten men, two ten men of boys in Italy. So the trade up potential is there. So I think maybe CSM is not as good of a matchup. Probably we would have to get more data on it. And this is a point where we realize what we need to prepare more for the winter team champs or the Battle of Britain, right? Where to look for the, the answers within the team. But talking about answers, let's talk about an army that answers some of the armies quite. Vic, you got to taste Tau before they got good at WTC when we when you were playing our Tau player. What's your take on them? Oh yeah, they caught me by surprise. They were really like I I, I mean for WTC, I think maybe they weren't the best choice, but phew, they were right on the edge of being incredible. And they got so many points drops in this balanced data slate that I think it really pushes them up to a very, very competitive level. And that's for singles. For teams, I think they start to become even better. They have some matchups they absolutely just blow out the water. Like you put Tau against Necrons, you are just removing all of them. And I think for teams, they are an incredibly powerful tool for you to have in your pairings because the... Uh, the lists skew to a very particular kind of damage profile uh, that can just be a nightmare for some armies to deal with. I don't know what you think, Nathan. No, I agree. I think Tau, Tau definitely pushed themselves up with the way the meta looks like it's shifting. I can definitely, for me, they're A tier. Uh, I can definitely see a lot of teams taking them. Mm -hmm. Although, when you go through their matrix, I'd be interested to see, say, if we're comparing them now to the S and A tier that we have, how great are they? Not 100% sure. Like, you don't feel like Tower favorites against Eldar? No, definitely not. Do you feel like they're favorite against CSM? No, a little bit better than the Eldar, but still pretty bad. It's a shooting match versus Votan. He's got a lot more armor. Yeah, yeah no. we te tested that. that. Actually, Votan just pushes the Tau off the board. I think similar thing can happen with Chaos Knights or Orcs. Yeah. I think Tau will prey on players not knowing how to play against them. That's why we're at this point seeing them having such a good win rate and performing quite well. I think they will get a little bit worse when the average player gets to know how to do it. So I, I do also think the list will change for Tau because I think there's yeah. still a lot of tools which aren't like everyone's just gone, okay, 663 crisis suits, let's go. And I think uh, that's straight up wrong. The second uh, six men just uh, you don't have I, resources for that. I think there's a lot of units in there which people are not like considering, you know, and uh, I'll be really interested to see if other stuff makes it into the, the Tau composition uh, and, and kind of mm. gives them some game in different directions. The direct anti-tank is an issue for Tau, which is easily solved by a number of units in their codex. So we'll be, I'll be really keen to see how they, they get on. Yeah, I think we've been toying with more like double breacher fish version mm -hmm. and having more smaller units, etc. You still heavily invest into vehicles because Tetras are a hell of a drag. So you might as well, with Tetras and Crisis, just go full in to bring it down. But this army also has a problem within teams that was very visible for us at WTC already. And that's it gives away bring it down so easily that basically by playing the game and not shooting Tau, they will probably give you nearly 16 points from bring it down, which is, you know, a nice gift for, from them, but at the same time, you then play homers against them, and they start to have to push you off the primary to play the game. So they need to push into you, and suddenly the games become quite drawish. That was our problem with Tower WTC. But their matrix was usually draws or small losses, small wins, but you couldn't push for a very high win because you still gave out secondaries and you could do nothing about it. And you had some awful matchups, and I think it will still apply because the more tower lists build, they have problem with target saturation and activation locking. 
because you need to shoot nearly all of the weapons into one target and suddenly you, it becomes a problem because you might not have enough resources to put enough units to kill that vehicle with units inside, etc., etc., and the problems will just stack. So I think they are a good army, but hot take with their win rate, I think they might not in, even be in A tier, in my opinion. Yeah. I've, co I've convinced myself into B tier, actually. <laughs> Until we see how it evolves and improves, mm -hmm. yeah, I think if you're playing a sliding scale scoring, how good are they at pushing differential? Like we've talked about, Votan going first with Scout, CK, CSM, Eldari, all very good at pushing the differential. I don't know how... Tau might win a lot of games, but they might be like 11-9s. Even That's if it. they do well into those games, they're maybe not actually holding the And I think this is the point where we need to know how bad their bad matchups are. Because the worse they are, the worse they are in the pairings and the whole team composition. So that's where I, I would probably put it above Grey Knights, just because they can delete some of the armies. Welcome, Necrons. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, I'm not super, super sold on Tau when I had more time to think about them. Okay. Even though we took them for WTC. Hmm. You were saying something, Vic? No, I think that's completely fair. You guys have convinced me as well. Uh, maybe they're better for singles. I got my take the opposite way. Yes, I think yeah. so. I agree with that statement. And I think it depends also on the terrain pack. Because when I looked at the UKTC board, some of the like if you were playing Hammer and Anvil, so I think it was the first Shadow round, so the sixth round of LGT. I think that table was horrific for like not horrific, horrible for Tau. Like the Hammer and Anvil, you couldn't use your mobility to grab angles. You were just pushed into your own deployment, and I think this will be a common problem for that army that into some matchups, if you cannot abuse the fact that you are faster than your opponent, it suddenly becomes a problem. But I think they are still good. I just am worried that their bad matchups might be like 16-4, 15-5 wins for the army that's opposing them. So suddenly you do not have the upsides of such an army, but you mostly have the downsides within the team comp. Yeah. And now another army that's very close to your heart, Vic. Well, Thousand Sons. What's your take on them? Oh, Thousand Sons. Uh, Thousand Sons got surprisingly hit hard in the data slate uh, from uh, a, a few angles, which you know I hadn't really considered was going to happen. I actually thought Thousand Sons were going to come through this pretty strong, maybe go under the radar a little bit, but they they got points changes on a lot of the units I was using for my WTC list. Uh, pretty much the whole list, everything went up. Uh, except for a couple of, like, maybe I think the Rhino didn't. <laughs> That's it. And the Zangor Enlightened. Um, and they had some core rule changes which affected them as well. The You can't make all the strats cost zero CP now really reduces the effectiveness of one of their Kabbalist rituals, uh, particularly for the strategy of using indirect fire regularly every turn, and which was the main thing that me and Arne were doing. Um, so... Playing the list again after the balanced data slate, you get a lot less units. Well, not a lot less. You get like one less unit, uh, but it feels worse than that. You get one less unit, a little bit less chaff, but then when you're playing it on the board, you're struggling to put your output into the right areas while having less resources than the opponent. That combined with a meta shift for Eldari lists away from Wraith Knights, creates a problem in the meta where you can't really play against these kind of more MSUE kind of uh, Eldar lists as well as you could play against the double rate night builds with T-Suns. Um, leaves them in an awkward spot in the meta, I think. I think they're still a very good army. I think they're still strong, but they're nowhere... I, I think they were one of the best armies in the game uh, at WTC, and now they've gone to just being an okay army. Um, and I'd probably sit them somewhere in, in B tier, personally. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think you can take them... You probably take Grey Knights over them. And I mm. think this is the case. when you Because they can win some matchups highly. I mean, like Thousand Sons still can push some of the matchups, still can win. When I I think we'll look back at the tier in, in just a second when we go through the army, all armies, and then we'll 
just consider what's happening. So then what? We've got NITs. I haven't got much experience with NITs. Nathan, you, you had more, so wake us, walk us through it. We know John Lennon is yeah. Art of War team killer, but what about non-John Lennon players? So NITs are in an interesting place. So if you take what was arguably one of their better versions last season or before the update, which was Sean Naden's list. You've lost the two Tyran effects, which really hurts you into what would have been the meta then. But the meta is so different now. Marine, sorry, Nids are very, very good at killing Marine profiles. Overall, like you look at a lot of the unit options, a lot of the monsters, damage options, and those just aren't as popular anymore. You don't see Death Watch anymore. You don't see Custodes anymore. You aren't seeing as many Marine armies. And the ones you are seeing are things like Dark Angels, where that's a lot more of a slog of a game. You're not seeing like a Thousand Suns, those kind of armies. And you're playing more things that maybe are able to either avoid getting shot like CSM or are still things like Eldar, which it's a game, but it's still heavily in Eldar favor. The new NID book has brought in some interesting options that I don't necessarily think have been fully explored yet. The, for teams, for singles, I would put NIDs towards like middle of B tier. They've got some half decent lists. The monster list is still good. Double Fill of Pain is still good. Um, they have good solid scoring. Still very good at being able to have loads of little MSU units to do cards. So they're very solid when it comes to actually scoring points. The Horde Nid list might bump it up a little bit because it does give you the, the chance to play into certain armies. But then again, you look at its matrix now, Horde Nids definitely doesn't want to play CSM. Probably is somewhat favorable into Eldari, but it's like 11, 12. You're not, you don't actually have the damage output. If the Eldar goes first and it's, say, double Wraith Guard, he completely blocks off two objectives, and you don't have the damage output to really take them off. Votan, Chaos Knights. again, Chaos Knights is awful for Horde. Herd Guard, Monster, like 20 Herd Guard just kills the whole Horde the whole in one turn. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It, it, it's one of those, the Matrix is not looking great. All those Marine armies have the uh, aggressors in them. They're picking up most of the Horde armies. Tau. Granted, Tau is an interesting one because it's, you are, don't forget, the Horde army is, you just save all your CP. So you every 20 man unit you kill, you're you bringing something back. If Tau's better because it has one giant piece of damage, whereas the lists that, say, for example, I don't know, other lists that might require you to go shoot one thing, shoot another thing, shoot another thing, into, say, that Horde army, it gets to move a thousand times. So you might be able to get some points play there. But, yeah, don't think nids are looking amazing, but they are very solid. So... For me, I would put them around the Thousand Suns genes to the cult area. So mid B tier. Vic, anything to add? I haven't played against the new Nids yet, but that seems uh makes seems to make sense to me. Yeah, and I think that's something that we've been also feeling about the faction in Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, then we've got war leaders. So Antoni's favorite child. I mean second favorite after Dark Eldar, I guess. And uh, I saw the army in play. Mm -hmm. I must say, it surprised me, like positively surprised me in how much damage it deals and how much pressure it just creates with all the... When you suddenly have, what, 28 bounds sitting three inches away from your deployment turn one, you surely start to sweat. Uh, okay, so Anthony just said that he likes word eaters more. So now, Anthony, as you're listening to us, you can probably hate what we're going to say, but I think the army just looked good. Like, I'm not super sold how well it will perform in team's composition in the sense that if it's 
not given a table where my, all my experience with the army was on UKTC boards, which have insanely good staging points with the movement that world leaders have. I'm not super sold how it will perform when it is bound to be an attacker. But I think we might be somewhere around that area, like in previous edition, that it might be just like first or second defender that just has very good defensive capabilities by being very offensive. So I'm curious how it will apply to WTC boards, but the army looked decent. But the fact when I compare it to like Voten or CSN, the fact that it doesn't have any shooting leaves me a little bit more restrained about how good it will perform because suddenly if there's, I don't know, game of Antony against Manny where there was one cultist surviving and just running around Antony's deployment zone and he could do nothing about it because that storm bolter on the Rhino couldn't see that cultist. It's a problem for such a faction. So I, I, I think they are somewhere, in my opinion, in B tier. Like I could actually consider them. I don't know where they are in that B tier, seeing the games. I think this is another case if you have a good player, it can actually make it work. But maybe you guys have anything to add. Vic, yourself? I think you mentioned the main weakness, just having an army which has no shooting. Um, immediately, you know, makes uh, makes for some challenging games against good players. So, I mean, if they're going in B tier, I think they've got to be near the bottom of it. Sorry, Anthony. Yeah, Anthony just said top B, bottom A for most people. Uh, Nathan, how much do you disagree with him? <laughs> yeah, I, for me, they're B tier. I don't know enough about the faction, but on potential alone, it should be medium B tier. Um, I guess we kind of know what Gene Steeler Cult does, so it's hard to say their world eaters are higher than, say, GSC, but then again, I don't know. I don't know enough about them, but Granted, we all knew that if they went down enough points, they would be more, much more viable. Again, like we discussed earlier, how many top players are actually playing them? We haven't seen them in a team's environment yet. So on potential, I would put them at medium to high B tier. I think. Yeah, I think they have one good thing going for them with how hyper-aggressive the faction is. It can bring high scores. And that's something that you can account for in teams, even though it might have some bad matchups, but by the same fact that they, it's playing very hyper-aggressively, it is in a quite good position. So I would say it's somewhere around B tier, but I think it's more around the Tau level, just because it can bring higher scores, whereas I feel seeing the armies that we have lower in the B tier, like Nets or GSC, they didn't feel like bringing high scores, at least to me. So I think there is like additional value in the team composition. Yeah. It's like Tau having no combat. They have the inability sometimes to yeah. push people off primary, whereas this is the opposite problem of you can't yeah. kill strays. <laughs> and we've got a super chat. No, Patrick, we weren't very harsh on your below, beloved tab more details so it's all good and now for the hot take i think necrons are hot garbage in the team composition <laughs> whoa how come okay so you remember how for the wtc usa brought a comp that shot on gsc now let's think about how necrons perform in this team they there's chaos space marines chaos knights voten and then either Tau or Dark Angels in the opposing team. As long as the opposing team has four or five arms that counter your army, that army cannot be paired in any way, shape, or form because the first defender, second defender, third defender will counter you. So you cannot be put as a defender because those defenders will be put as an attacker into you. So you cannot escape in the pairings from being just preyed upon. And this being an army that's quite popular, I think it will be preyed upon by most of the team composition just by the fact which armies are good in the game. And it's quite easy to tailor your team composition to also 
be better into Necrons whilst not losing into other factions, I think. And I just think Necrons are straight up bad for your team. Like, it will be a problem. Like, the what the score of GSC against USA with six losses and one draw against them, I think most of the teams will be able to punish your Necron pick if they actually think about how they want to build the team. So there's my hot take. I would probably put it below GSC. Uh, yeah, that seems like a really fair spot to put it, to be honest. Yeah, I, I, th um, I thought you were going to put it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I was going <laughs> to argue like... against you because uh, I think while they're not great, I think they're like really middle of the road here and definitely yeah. better than the armies in C tier. I, I think at that point you need to go with even harder skew with the Necrons. I think you need to not play the regular 2020 squad. And with like took tan, no, you need to go like eighty or hundred warriors and just push one hyper build into one direction instead of going for the balanced version because the balanced version can be countered. And suddenly chaos knights cannot deal with hundred warriors in on those middle objectives, but they can kill forty, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where I think there's the room for you to play the army. But that's my take. I think you need to go away from the Liam Hackett version because now everyone is aware of it and it will be exploited. For me... And I... Sorry, Karen. Yeah, David Gaylard is saying that Necron's worst matchups are like Tau, K-Space Marines or Dark Angels. And I heavily disagree with the games I've seen. <laughs> but you were saying, Nathan. So for me... It, yeah, if we're looking at a four-man team or a five-man team, they're like bottom of B, top of C. But for an eight-man team, I I could still see myself taking them above GSE, Nids, Thousand Suns, Grey Knights, probably World Eaters because they're more stable, maybe even Tau, to the point where I would put them either bottom of A or top of B. Because I think... With eight, you do eventually run out of... They can't use all their top armies all the time to counter your Necrons. But yes, the less players you have, the worse Necrons get. But I think in eight, I still think with the amount of tweaking you can do with them, if you do have to go back to, say, like a double Lich Guard blob, they did so well at the actual WTC. I know the meta's changed since then. But... Yeah, I just I still like them at being able to do the fixed game, being able to tank a lot of the good armies. Um, there's also, and I don't know how everyone knows it or however, Liam Hackett was still playing it a very certain way. I'm still not fully aware how he was doing it. There's obviously still something there with somebody who scored 120 something points. I don't know. So for me, it's top of B. So I guess fix so size. Liam was playing it heavily using the free strat for additional reanimation or heroic intervention, which mm -hmm. both do not work now with the changes to sure. free strats ah, sure. being only battle tactics. So mm -hmm. it completely changes how he played the faction. And I think n I still stand, even though he had very good score, I think this army is not performing as well into good opponents. That's my take on it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know Guto was it's... is struggling nowadays with the faction. And if Guto is saying to me that he's not really liking how it looks, I kind of trust him in that statement. Uh, okay, so, yeah. I think people's initial take when the date slate drop was that Necron's got a really big buff out of it and they'd sit well in the meta. But it's one of those but things I, I can see. I can see us considering uh... them a little bit higher in eight months. I think if you were not playing against only very good players, they are, have way more value because as soon as an opponent makes one mistake, where if you listen to the episode with Liam Hackett from the normal blogs, most of his opponents did that one mistake and then lo suddenly lost 20-0. Mm -hmm. If your opponent doesn't make that one mistake, suddenly they have a very good game, in my opinion, into the army. But you need to build your faction to be able to play it. So, Sure. We did it. Now, uh, I know it's been a long one. I think we can do some small adjustments now. I think with what we are saying, I think Blood Angels should drop to D tier 
using the same logic we apply to other marines yeah they just don't feel like the same thing as with death watch like i wouldn't take them over dark angels black templars i don't know how i feel about dark Tem black templars I haven't seen enough of their games they just feel like a flood which might be good enough i am not super sure so i'd probably drop them somewhere into b tier in my opinion yeah i drop them into b tier now we look at the rest of the list that's like yeah then i think orcs are probably i don't know i feel like they might drop from a tier as well because if we look back into the comments we had uh lucas troller well someone who might know a little bit about orcs said that top of the meta is very hostile to orcs ha 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 and then <laughs> said eldar got much better with no rave knight but csm chaos knights and votan just slaughter you so seeing that csm chaos knights and votan just slaughter you and we look at what we consider three out of four top armies Suddenly, this means you do not play well into the very top of the meta. So I think this means we drop orcs one tier as well. Agree. Maybe next yeah, couple so, of beaters. Yeah. Mm. So I guess if we're saying S and A are these are the armies you would basically almost always see in a top eight, for example, do, are you always going to see guard in top eight? Does Guard need to move down to B? Because B seems like the option armies. Yeah. I feel like Guard, I still think like the indirect version actually has place in the other faction armies. Sure. I still would, I wouldn't be surprised if play, playing the indirect version, even though it's very boring in the singles meta. I think in the teams, it might still be insanely powerful in the pairings. Because suddenly, if the Chaos Space Marine doesn't want to play it, say Dark Angels don't want to play it. The problem that Guard has is the very big proliferation of transports we see nowadays. And we see those transports in Chaos Space Marines, in Orcs, in Votan. I don't know how well that indirect version will play into those kinds of factions, but it still had Hellhounds. So I would actually keep Guard probably below the Dark sure. Angels. Yeah. But I still think if we try to look for the indirect version, I still feel like this has insane play into most of the meta, even now. Yeah, yeah. But you need to be good with it. But I think this applies to nearly every faction we are thinking about. So, yeah, this uh, really good. Yeah, I'm not sure about the Death Guard Custodies. Like, I think if we were to maybe think a little bit more about it we could probably split some of the b factions into c factions but i think what we identified and i think what's kind of important whenever you are thinking about your team composition i think is looking what we consider as s and a tier and what we consider d tier so it gives you a good inclination to what bring and what to not bring into your team co composition I quite like it. So if you take S and A tier, and then you can pick two of the B tier to finish off your army, your composition, it kind of works nicely. And so then, like, the B tier is quite deep. Mm. Yeah. And I could see someone not taking guard, for example, and taking something from B tier. Like, guard it feels very on the edge, at least for me. Mm. Yeah, I agree. You could go to the top of B tier easily. I know there is a little bit of a difference between them, but... C and D almost, if you want to look at it as S -er, always take these two, A -er, basically always take these four, B is these are the options that you would maybe see in teams, C and D, these are the armies, that, or basically C are the armies you just don't take realistically. Although I will defend my power you armor plus. Yeah, I think I think they are somewhere a little bit higher after seeing Mitch and Lamar games. But yeah. that's kind of it. Yeah, yeah I, I think was. I think it's quite good for how mu not much we know at this point. I think the meta was so heavy focused on the very top that we do not have the data about the lesser factions yet. And I think with the now there's a team event happening in Prague this weekend. Then we have one team event in three weeks in Poland. Then in a month, there's a 
Winter Team Championship. And then we also have what? Uh, the Battle of Britain. And there's one more team event that I know Robo is attending. So yes, suddenly there's so many team events that we'll get way more data to actually base our opinions of. Because we might not really know what we are talking about at this point. And I love it because even at WTC, none of the teams actually knew what they were doing. <laughs> Yeah. We had a rough idea, but it was still a rough idea. And I think this is very interesting because it shows that at any point, there's so much left to player skill and that skill expression that, for example, in an eight man, if Anthony said, I want to bring a war leaders, I wouldn't tell him not to. Mm -hmm. And this would same apply to some people playing Thousand Suns or GSC, right? If you are really good with the faction, we would allow you to play it, right? And I think this is the place where you could look for your faction specialists to shine, because if you have those lesser armies in team composition, they will also benefit from the fact that the opponent will not be as well-versed into them. So there's that another layer of benefits for the team. But yeah, Vic, you want to do some of your plugs? I don't know, maybe your podcast that I was on as well. Yeah, of course. So uh, me and Dave, we, we run a podcast called 40K Fireside, talk about topics in competitive 40K. We get some great guests like Typhus on, uh, just have a little chat. And uh, yeah, we, we kind of try and release episodes at least once every two weeks. There'll be an LGT episode coming out soon with Liam VSL, which I think should be really interesting. So uh, that's a good one. We're all play for a team called Team Ignite, and uh, you should look out for some content that we're going to put together with more of the team uh, soon, website, coaching services, things like that. So if you're looking for more of those sultry voices, then definitely head to Fireside to enjoy it with some jazz. And Nathan, any team events coming soon for you? Are you going to anything else except Battle of Britain? So I've got Battle of Britain. Um, then I might be going to Cardiff, but it seems unlikely now because Josh can't go. Um, other than that, I've got some singles. I've got uh, Coventry GT and Leicester GT in the next two months or so, which I'm sure you'll be at as well, Vic. Yeah, just next door. Yeah, yeah, it's easy for Convenient. us. Well, I, I don't even have to get a hotel, I can just drive 40 yeah. minutes away from me. And on the closing notes, actually, I just remembered because I'm an awful host. There's one thing if you're a member of our Patreon, you get access to our Discord. And by accessing our Discord, you can ask questions for the future episodes and even suggest us episode topics that we will talk about. And there are actually very short questions for you, Vic. Okay. So it's been over a year now of having 40K Fireside. What have been some of the biggest things learned and what could listener, listeners expect in the future? That's from Sam Lemon. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the biggest things I learned, actually, well, we learned a lot about the way we communicate and share our knowledge. That was that was a big thing. It was also a little bit eye opening just how much people love tier lists. Uh, you know, <laughs> we got like a massive explosion of uh, of our audience from one of the tier lists that we did, and uh, from then on, the channel's been even more popular. Um, the final thing was just interacting with the community. I think we found it quite interesting because sometimes you. You go in thinking, oh, some people are a little bit toxic, a little bit crazy in the community. But, and I thought maybe we'd be exposed to quite a bit of that, putting ourselves out there. We sometimes have quite strong opinions on things. But overall, people have kind of interacted quite nicely with us. It gives me some, some hope that, you know, even though we may be very passionate nerds, we, we still all uh, kind of are working together towards some common goal. So, um, I think overall, it's been a very, very positive learning experience. And then second question from Sam. As someone who has a demanding professional career of a dentist, if he's not mistaken, what advice would you have balancing your desire to compete and spend time in your competitive hobby whilst still being dedicated to your professional career as well as being a good family member? I think family is the priority. I think, um, you know, if, if anything comes up Not 40K? to that, is that's the only thing which can take priority over 40K. I think your career, depending on where you are in it, you, you know, you've got to find balance with it. And one of the ways of balancing out the stress that can come from working really, really hard is to find hobbies like this. 
it's also really important um, to, to kind of have friends and people around you who you chat with who are not just work colleagues in your family. And I think 40K, especially for maybe some of the more introverted of us, which this hobby does tend to, to gather, um, it's, it's really helpful to be able to get friends with shared hobbies and we can get very passionate about a hobby like Warhammer 40K. So I think it's a perfect way of balancing against other things which are more stressful in life. Yeah. And on the closing note, as I've done Scott plugs before for the Discord and Patreon, mm -hmm. Vic, who has the best teeth in 40K and any top dental <laughs> teams? Who, who has the best teeth? Oh, who is... I'm trying to think. I don't even... You know, people think I look at people's teeth all the time. I, I really don't. Who's like a beautiful person? Uh, Foxy's got to have good teeth, doesn't he? No, I don't know. It doesn't come to mind. Does Josh? Josh has good teeth, right? Nah, buttons, nah. man. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know. Alex Harris. He's got that. He's got that London look where it's got a gap oh, in the middle. Yeah. It can't. It can't be anywhere from England. I don't know. I don't know, Titus. It's got to be you, right. man. Let's go for you, Titus. No, definitely not me. No, in this probably someone angle, from US. Great. <laughs> probably someone from US. They have that <laughs> yeah, culture of be. having the dental you know straightening the, their teeth so i would guess someone from the us team. what a question that would be right. I'm, I'm trying to think if anybody we know has got turkey tea no uh, no one's had that big work done no. harrison would be the uh, one who'd do it <laughs> oh he'd hundred no he's got those buck teeth so it's definitely not harrison either um oh, fantastic well i'll keep an eye out and i'll make yeah. sure to reply to that comment when i find someone okay if i ones. ever again invite you in some <laughs> please remember <laughs> We'll have to answer that one. Or, you know, we'll ask you for your next fireside podcast, you know? That's it. You're not escaping this one. It's very important <laughs> to get to know. Anyway, thank you everyone for watching or listening. This one will also go on Spotify. Although, if you like enjoying the sites of Vic VJ, you probably should go on the YouTube to also watch it here. But, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Nathan, for coming over for co-hosting as usual, and Vic for gracing us with your voice and allowing us a good night's sleep. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you, Typhus. Cheers, Nathan. Cheers, guys. It always ends for like 10 seconds, so it's great. <laughs>